Most of us have at least heard of MedPAC. Uh, if not, uh, you should know about them because they basically uh, inform Congress everything about you. So I'm going to just briefly give you a description here. The Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, is an independent congressional agency established by the Balanced Budget Act back in 1997. It advises Congress on issues affecting the Medicare program, no surprise. The Commission's statutory mandate is quite broad, however. In addition to advising Congress on payments to private health plans participating in Medicare and providers in Medicare's traditional fee-for-service program, MedPAC also is tasked with analyzing access to care, quality of care, and of course other issues affecting Medicare. Today we're having what is called a fireside chat. There is no fire, we're not allowed to have a fire, but it is I think an intimate look and into the MedPAC system by a prior uh, MedPAC commissioner, Jack Hoadley. Um, I'd like you to welcome Mike Schweitz who's also will be moderating um, and can't wait to hear what he has to say. Thank you. Are we live? Yeah. All right. Um, first, I want to welcome Dr. Jack Hoadley. Uh, we are fellow Hoyas, or whatever that is, <laughs> uh, from Georgetown. Actually, it's a plant. Did you know that? I always hear that. What the hell's a Hoya? <laughs> yeah. So Hoya is a climbing evergreen. But anyway, uh, Dr. Hoadley uh, is a research uh, professor emeritus at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown. His interests long term are health policy and specifically drug supply and pricing. Uh, Dr. Hoadley has just rotated off of MedPAC, which he's going to tell us a little about. Uh, I think you spent six years on MedPAC. Uh, and I just will start off with just what, it, what does MedPAC do and what is its impact? Sure. Well, I'm happy to be here today uh, to be part of this uh, session. Um, MedPAC is an advisory commission to the U.S. Congress, and it's been around since the late 1990s and really replaced uh, two prior commissions that I'm sure some of you know about, the Physician Payment Review Commission, or PPRC, and the Prospective Payment Assessment Commission, or PROPAC. Um, and those two uh, existed back in the, I guess we're having those two existed um, back in the 1990s and 1980s uh, to deal specifically with the hospital and physician payment systems, but under the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, were brought together to create you know, one commission that could deal with the program more broadly. As an advisory commission to the Congress, MedPAC, we don't have any authority. I still kind of, kind of say we because I've always been off of it for such a short time. And I should say, one of the caveats I always make is that I don't speak on behalf of MedPAC. I didn't when I was on it. I always speak for myself. Uh, more true now that I'm not a member. Um, MedPAC doesn't have any power over anything. Uh, MedPAC is advisory. MedPAC makes recommendations to the Congress, to CMS, to HHS, and suggestions. But, you know, it really is the case that the kind of recommendations that we make, some by formal vote that are in the bold print in the reports and others that are you know, more general statements that maybe the commission sends in comments to CMS uh, or writes in the text of a report, really do get listened to. Um, one of the ways I became aware of that when I went to work almost 20 years ago now at HHS, one of the things I regularly heard when I would sit in decision-making meetings is, is you know, has MedPAC weighed in on this issue. And the folks inside HHS wanted to know that, and certainly the things do end up, many of our recommendations do end up getting passed into law. Good. Well, you're well aware of our concerns about physician reimbursement. What, what, are med, what were MedPACs and what are MedPACs' views on the reimbursement system and recent issues related to it? Yeah. So. You know, MedPAC has, I mean, I, I go back, I was a staffer at PPRC uh, about the time that the Medicare fee schedule actually went into effect, and I guess it was 1992. 
Um, and so, you know, PPRC, the predecessor to MedPAC, was around at the creation of the fee schedule. And I think all along, you know, that commission and now MedPAC really believe strongly in some of the core principles that underline the payment systems. That physician fees should be based on the work and the resources that go into providing a service. Uh, and it should be done in a way that's fair, that treats uh, primary care equitably with specialty care and so forth. And one of the concerns has been in recent years and that MedPAC has talked a lot about is the ways in which the system has become a little too far skewed away from uh, the core of primary care, whether it's delivered by a primary care physician or whether it's delivered by a rheumatologist or somebody else uh, who's seeing that patient, doing office visits, talking to the patients, and the, the payment for those services just has not kept up with the payment for others. And so, you know, we've talked a lot. There's a chapter in the um, most recent report, the last one that I was involved with, the June 2018 report, to begin to try to surface some ways to rebalance the fee schedule. You know, I know there's also been issues about this new proposal from CMS, and I heard talking about it this morning, for the e &M payments. And I think if you look at the comments that MedPAC sent to CMS, you know, I thought it captured very well some of the issues with that new proposal going at some issues that are real issues, like documentation concerns, but doing it in a way that doesn't seem to really um, work in a way that's gonna, gonna change the system in a good direction. So lumping together uh, so many levels of visits means patients who need more intensive kinds of care are gonna end up either not getting that, have doctors who don't wanna see them, or getting told you have to come back for two or three visits to work through the different things, and that becomes an, an issue for the patient, for the beneficiary. And so, you know, use that as a starting point to think about what's the better way to address the problems of documentation, of rebalancing the fee schedule to better, to better deal with uh, visits and primary care. When you talk about primary care, you're really referring to cognitive care, yeah. are you not? So cognitive care includes services provided by non-primary care physicians as well. So you're talking about E&M codes. That's right. And what was the recommendation from MedPAC regarding reimbursement for E&M codes for the, next, for the following year? So, um, you know, the commission in, in the most recent report did not get to the, to the point of an actual recommendation but put some issues out there in terms of some ideas that I think they're gonna spend more time this year trying to work through to get to the recommendation to figure out what's the right way to shift from procedural services to cognitive services uh, to try to move some money in that direction. What, what they've done a lot of research on, the staff has really done some good work on, are the various ways that procedural services have tended to get better paid and when procedures get more efficient and so forth, don't get that sort of downgrading of the payment, uh, and because you, you don't gain efficiencies in cognitive care, it still takes the same number of minutes to sit there with your patient to make a decision about how to treat them or to explain the treatment options to them or whatever it may be. Uh, it's those cognitive services that lose out in that, in that process. And so, you know, in our various discussions over two or three years now, we've tried to, to think about different ways, and then you get caught up in the formulas. You know, how do you do it so that the right people get helped and, and, and you don't hurt in places that it shouldn't be when you know that all this is going to be done in some kind of a budget neutral basis? In, in one of the reports, I guess it was this year or last year, that one of the recommendations was to scrap MIPS and replace it with a value-based system. Can you talk a little bit about what led to that? Yeah, and we had quite a long and quite an elaborate discussion about that because we knew this was you know, gonna hit pretty hard. And, 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 you know, I think the commission and all of us on the commission were very committed to a lot of the values in MACRA, a lot of the desire to move to more of a value-based approach. We were concerned about, particularly on the MIPS side, that there were just a lot of flaws in what was done there, that it was gonna be very burdensome, and CMS's own estimates suggested the amount of money that would be spent uh, trying to, to, to fulfill things. We were concerned about issues of small numbers, that, that the kind of scores that people got would not be equitable. Um, 
you know, even as it's being implemented right now, lots of physicians are being exempted, and so the ones that are left, uh, just, there's just not a lot of people to be basing on what's going on. So, you know, you had a couple of choices. We could try to figure out how to rejigger the current MIP system, or what we finally landed on was to scrap the mix, MIP system as it was done and try to come up with a new system. Um, you know, we didn't, in our recommendation, we really just pointed to the idea of a new system. We called this, this value program. Um, and I don't, I don't claim that we had it all worked through and thought through, but our idea is you could figure out ways for physicians to band together in some kind of groups, be measured on data that's already being collected, so it's not new measures to be sewn in. It doesn't have the, the flaw of the system where, you know, you submit one measure, you submit another measure, you submit another measure, and somehow across three different measures we're going to compare, uh, but to try to use standard measures that can be pulled out of claims data based on groupings that people form that don't have to be elaborate formal organizations, but more informal kinds of things. Now, working out how that really is going to work, you know, is something we don't feel like we had it all figured out, but we thought, let's recommend, and of course it's only a recommendation that the MIPS be scrapped, that, that we begin a process and, and MedPAC, the, the current group of MedPAC commissioners can continue to be part of that conversation of how to come up, how to start from our simple idea and try to build more of the rules and the regulations around them. Or CMS could pick up, we could start with demonstrations and so forth. Um, but I think it, it was a sense that there needs to be a new method or we'll end up with uh, another system that isn't very fairly done and nobody's going to benefit from that. Well, we fought long and hard to change the SDR. Right. Uh, getting MIPS at us, I don't say for us, I say at us, uh, has been another onerous endeavor. And it clearly was the intent of Congress uh, to develop this kind of system. And many of us spent a lot of hours talking to our legislators about it. Uh, it's it's going to be kind of onerous to get something changed at this point, is it not? We appreciate that. And, you know, there are alternative pathways. Some have recommended that we take something like the the value program that we came up with the idea for, see if you could do it through demonstration authority to start to work it out within the MIPS framework. CMS is obviously already evolving the MIPS framework. What we're concerned about is that if we sort of like build into a flawed framework and then people get kind of entrenched in it, it gets even harder to adjust it. Exactly. So the idea is to start to make some, some changes before the thing gets as entrenched. And even if something bad is entrenched, it's still hard to get out of it because you're kind of used to it. And sometimes you get more fear of the new and the change and the unknown than the system you don't like today. Well, I can tell you we don't like the system today. So hopefully something better will come along, but uh, hopefully it'll be a while. Um, moving to a different uh, area, I know that one of your areas of interest in your research for many years has been drug pricing and patient access, particularly under Part D. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and your views of those issues, since it's been a, a big topic in today's program? Yeah. So, you know, I started, uh, I like to say I started following Medicare Part D before it existed, um, because actually when I was at HHS in the 90s, um, as, a, as a career manager of a group of folks in the planning evaluation office dealing with health financing, uh, the political folks at the time came to us and said, you know, we think one of the biggest missing pieces of the Medicare program is outpatient drugs. Basically, people aren't covered, and they have to get it through one kind or another supplemental coverage, or they pay out of pocket. And, you know, that made sense in a Medicare program in 1960s when drugs were mostly non-existent and where they did exist, they were cheap. But by the 1990s, that wasn't true anymore. And, you know, what looked expensive then doesn't even look that expensive today. So we started trying, a group of us on the staff started trying to, to sit down and figure out what a drug program to cover outpatient drugs in Medicare might look like. And we drew up a bunch of specifications. We, a bunch of us that didn't know a lot about prescription drugs, and that included me at the time, you know, got it, did our homework, figured out how you would sort of do this. What should insurance look like? We did an analysis, for example, of the prices that people faced when they went in uninsured, not just the out-of-pocket cost, but the total price of the drug for somebody who didn't have insurance card. 
was paying for a drug versus somebody who had an insurance card was paying. And we found that, that the uninsured person was paying a higher price. And of course, they had to pay it all themselves. So that was an argument right there for why a drug program seemed to make sense. And we specced out a program. Now, that program didn't come to be until 2003. So it was another half dozen years from the time we sort of put it together in the late 90s until it became law in 2003 and then became a program, an active program, as of 2006. But when I left the government and went to Georgetown in, in 02, um, and then shortly after Part D was, was enacted, I thought, you know, I've come to this with some background. I'm going to try to, to be a person who follows what goes on, watch from the beginning. And so one of the things we did, we got some funding from then the Kaiser Family Foundation to help look at, first of all, just who's offering this Part D program. You know, when, when it was created, everybody was worried there'd be no plans to come in and offer it. And lo and behold, it turned out there were probably too many plans offering it. But we wanted to look at how many plans, what were the premiums, what did the formularies look like. We knew formularies would be key, as is obvious from the kind of conversations you've been having so far today. So we started out in 2006 in that year one of Part D just trying to understand what the plan formularies look like. Did they look like sort of the minimum possible plans? Well, the answer to that was no. In fact, they went well beyond the statutory minimums. But we continued to want to look at how the tiering worked. We watched the evolution of tiering over the years. Uh, we watched the growth of prior authorization and step therapy use and so forth, and really just made it our goal to try to track that Part D program, follow up. Now, along the way, we also looked at things like the impact of the donut hole. We looked at, at the extent to which people switch plans. Short answer is they don't for the most part, even when they could be benefit by switching plans. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I think that the plans do some of the things they do with both their premium levels and some of their formulary design because they know people are sticky. People don't like to make switches, so they stay with the plan they're in rather than look for a plan that covers their drugs in a more effective way or does a better job of covering the drugs they need or does it more cheaply. And so in some ways, we think that empowers plans to maybe be more onerous with how they treat their, their enrollees. We've also done studies of the cost trends um, across the years and so forth. You've, you, I'm sure you're well aware of the president's uh, blueprint for drug pricing. Uh, where do you think that's going? What impact do you think it'll have on the supply chain? You know, it's interesting that the blueprint has a lot of items in it, and most of the blueprint is written as, we may consider X. We may consider Y. So there's not a lot that's concrete in the blueprint. Now, at the same time, there are a number of the items that were also in the president's budget for, for the fiscal year that's just ending up now. And of course, those were proposals that didn't go anywhere. Um, but I think it is going to continue to be an agenda. I actually think there's a number of items on the blueprint that are, that are not particularly controversial. A lot of the ones that are aimed at different ways to try to uh, do a better job with, uh, with drug prices that people face out of pocket, so the out of pocket costs. Well, several of our MedPAC recommendations are in the blueprint. So for example, something that I was very excited about, which was to have an absolute out of pocket cap for people's cost in Medicare Part D. You know, we have a catastrophic phase of the Part D benefit, but you continue to pay 5% of the drug cost even when you're in that catastrophic phase. In most of the list price. Over, well, even, right, it's 5% of list price. Even if that weren't an issue, the point is you're still paying 5% sure. of something. And it's higher because it's based on list price. Um, and so, you know, the ACA rules say overall that there has to be a hard out of pocket cap on your out of pocket costs. Uh, but we don't have that in Medicare. And so, MedPAC has a recommendation that says there should be a hard out of pocket cap on, on your out of pocket Part D costs. That's also in the president's blueprint. Um, so I think there's some ideas in there that are good, but I think that there are very few ideas that really go to drug pricing, and that's my concern about the blueprint. It does a lot of things, even if some of them are good things, some I might not like, um, that address out-of-pocket costs, and that's an important part to look at, but the underlying drivers of drug prices are really not addressed in the blueprint. Well, part of that driver, as we have demonstrated, we believe, is the PBM issue. How do you view that evolution? And you've been there since the beginning of PBMs. Right. 
And I've kind of watched PBMs as they've gone from years ago to really just being an administrative entity that helped do the claims processing. I mean, you know, I think back to, to before most people had drugs in their insurance plans, and, or if they did, that insurance was something where you had to send in your, your, your payment slips to the insurance company and get a reimbursement back. And so it was that shoebox effect. You collected all your receipts from the pharmacy, they sat in the shoebox, and most people, you know, maybe there was, it only started covering after the first couple hundred dollars, so you piled them up, wait, thinking I'll get to it when I've accumulated a couple hundred dollars, and the end of the year came and went, and they were still in the shoebox. So people didn't even take advantage of what they had. So one of the good things that happened, and this actually happened as part of Medicaid legislation, was to require that point-of-sale transaction system that means we all now go into the pharmacy, and that's all adjudicated right at the point of claim. You know, we go off and do our other shopping, come back to the counter, pick up our script. Nowadays, it probably came in already electronically. Uh, and it's already adjudicated, and we know what our copay is, and we only pay the copay. Now, again, all the issues that are going to come up aside. But it, mechanically, you know, that happens. That was what the PBMs first did. They were the entities that did that. That's kind of all they did at first. Then they moved on and started doing all these other things. And I think we've, we've gone through kind of a cycle where PBMs did a lot of things kind of surreptitiously. Um, there was a push about a decade ago for more transparency, which I actually think worked for a while. And now I think we've sort of taken a step back. I'm not quite sure why that cycle has happened. Because they could. And maybe it's simply because they could. Um, but there was pushback a decade ago, and I remember some of that, and, and employers got smarter about asking for more transparency when they bid out. Maybe it was the consolidation of the PBM industry that helped be part of that factor that changed that again. We're now back to a situation where there is more of that secrecy and more concerns about money that's sort of getting stuck in the system and never coming out to be seen anywhere else. And so, you know, it's all over as a topic. So there are various agencies in Washington that are looking into PBMs, committees that are doing hearings. You've talked about all this stuff happening at the state level. But I would put one word of caution out there. I'm concerned that if, if there's too much pushback on the PBMs or we were sort of take even a more extreme step of just taking them out of the system, what, what becomes the counterweight to the manufacturers? Now, you could say this should be done more consolidated with the plans, and that's, that's a perfectly good conversation to have. But one of the reasons the PBMs came to have the role they did was because there were lots of smaller health plans who didn't have the, in, the leverage individually, and so they sort of pooled their leverage through a PBM to negotiate with manufacturers. Now, we can talk about the flaws in that process and the money that's retained and the, some of the tools they use. But I do want to make sure, my advice to you is make sure as you're having those conversations, you don't so eliminate the leverage point to push back on the manufacturers when we don't have other kind of leverage on manufacturers, uh, the kind of pricing that they're doing. We may find ourselves with more price increases and that notion that um, Jeff was talking about in his talk where he said, um, you know, retail prices, list prices are going up, but net prices not so much. Some of that is what the PBMs are doing, but we want to get rid of the spread, we want to get rid of some of these things that leave the money sitting in the home of the PBM, but we don't want to do it in a way that turns the leverage back to the manufacturers so they're unchecked and raising their prices. And I think that's the challenge we've got. Well, we've always been pushed back by PBMs who visit our legislators first, and the question always is, uh, they're saving money. Uh, to which we reply, if you're, control, if you're saving money and controlling prices, how's that working out? I mean, in rheumatology, we've seen double-digit digit inflation almost yearly in many of our drugs. So they're really not fulfilling the function to the system uh, or to the patient population. That, those savings are being diverted into, into their own coffers. So th there's the real defect that we really need to address. But I, I think, you know, what I, what I wonder is would we have had, so if the, if the list price of some of those Embryl, Humira, Remicade kinds of drugs that you guys focus so much on, 
if the list price has gone up in these sort of double-digit ways, the net price has also gone up a lot, would the net price have even been higher in the absence of some of the negotiation? Or what's the alternative tool? Um, is it, you know, harnessing the company? I mean, I've always been struck by uh, you have, have two different products in Embril and Humira that are pretty direct competitors, and I'm not a clinician. I don't pretend to know about some of the distinctions of why one may be better for some patients than the others, but they're pretty direct competitors in a lot of ways. And, you know, when you've got Apple phones and, and uh, Sam Samsung phones competing with each other, you know, what you're tending to see is that the price comes back because they want to push back. We don't get that. What can get us, what can allow us to harness the power of the market to get at that? If it's not working with the PBMs because even though they get some spread, they keep it, then okay, let's move on, but let's figure out what the other thing is or we'll watch those double-digit increases from the manufacturers continue and, and we won't be any better off. The rebate system also drives that to some degree. Uh, the higher the rebate, obviously, the uh, more the PBM is garner garnering. So there's really no pushback to get drugs lower from the PBM. And I think that's one of, the, one of the defects. Not sure how you address that, other than through regulatory or legislative means. You, you are going to need regulatory approaches. And, and I think the, the biggest piece of that, um, or the, maybe it's not the biggest piece, the, the easiest to tackle piece of that are the situations, and you've talked some, Jeff talked about this in his talk, you had the examples of the Medicaid uh, drugs where it's only the brand, not the generic, when the generic would be cheaper for everybody. I think those are the most obvious ones that are the easiest to understand pieces. If there's a generic drug out there that is just fundamentally less expensive, we ought to make sure there aren't devices being used to prefer the brand because it's creating more revenue internally in that middleman process. That, and that seems to be what we see too often. Now, again, there was a process a decade ago when the big employer plans began to see that and they asked for more of that money to be passed back to them. We've sort of taken a step back seemingly from that and we've got these examples that are pretty, pretty outrageous. What I think is the tougher piece of that is where it's brand versus brand and what's the way, the way to harness that because you know, we're in a system where, you know, the PBM, the health plan, forget the PBM, let's just assume it was the health plan. The health plan doesn't take possession of the drug. So the rebate is there mechanically as a way to create a discount when the drug itself passes from manufacturer to pharmacy and you want your agent, the drug plan, to be negotiating for you and yet they don't actually take possession of the drugs. So what becomes our alternative means to do that? Do we have to go at some other thing? Do we have to think about other sort of government steps to look at pricing more directly? Um, you know, a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Len Nichols at George Mason University, was talking the other day about an idea where the amount of patent protection a manufacturer gets for its drug maybe should be, and, and, and Jeff talked in his talk about that notion of, of the Hatch-Waxman and the the fact that, you know, you get your 20-year patent, but you use a lot of that while you're doing your testing and your FDA process, and Hatch-Waxman adds years back into patent protection. Make sure you have at least something like eight years to be able to market your drug as the exclusive, and that's your incentive to innovate. So what Len came up with was an idea that maybe the length of that patent term, how many years of, of unfettered sale of that drug without a direct competitor, might be based on whether you commit to some kind of limit on annual price increases over that eight year period. If you want unlimited ability to raise your price from year to year, then you won't get eight years, you'll get five years. I mean, I'm just making up the specifics. If you agree to, to, to limit and say, I'm setting my price now, but I'm gonna leave, you know, that's a price I'm committing to, or with you know, modest uh, agreed in advance increases from year to year, then I get a longer term for my patent. So you're trading some length of term for price stability. This is something that private buyers do. I'm going to buy your product for the next three years. You're going to guarantee locking in that price for three years. So we may need to start thinking about those kinds of mechanisms. It's obviously a government thing that's got to be involved with that uh, to try to address prices. 
back at that manufacturer level, that if we're going to think about cutting the, the middlemen out of the system, I think we have to start thinking about some of those kinds of ideas of how to address pricing. And what what kinds of uh, policy changes has MedPAC uh, brought up in regard to drug pricing and programs? So it was kind of a point of frustration for, for the commission as we really started to tackle the whole drug pricing and the drug cost issue about almost as soon as I came on. It was probably about my second year on the commission when it really hit the agenda, when it hit a lot of our agendas. You know, five or six years, we've really been seeing some of these drug prices. The hep C drug kind of got our attention, I think, and, and, and drove prices up for a couple of years. MedPAC's jurisdiction is Medicare. So we have to kind of stay in our lane. And we can't, now we can talk about, we can research, we can comment on, but we don't feel we can make recommendations on patent law. We don't think we can make recommendations on FDA policy. We can note that Medicare is limited by what the FDA does or what patent law does. So we can point attention to that. And I suppose we could have written recommendations, but, it, but because we were established as a Medicare commission, we don't feel that's living up to our creation, the law that created us, so that we do opt to stay in our lane. So we have mostly focused on the things that affect cost to Medicare. So we focused on some of the ways that try to give the Part B part of the program. Uh, to what extent is the whole average sales price system working? To what extent is it not working? And we made a number of recommendations, uh, one of which is to address uh, price inflation, to say that there should be some kind of an inflation adjustment on the ASP. Uh, we suggested a potential way to resurrect in a very different manner the CAP program that we know didn't work very well when it was first created, and so we put on the table the idea that that could be done. Those are things that could be done within the Part B side. In Part D, we talked about the out-of-pocket CAP I mentioned earlier. Uh, we talked about some things around the donut hole pricing, um, trying to give plans more leverage so that the amount of government reinsurance means, and again, this can cut both ways, to allow the, the, plan, the Part D plans, if the government's not going to negotiate for the prices, uh, let the Part D plan actually have the incentive, because they're not so protected by reinsurance, uh, that they have very little incentive to negotiate prices for the Medicare Part D program. So we came up with some recommendations around that. Of course, if they do that more, they're going to use their existing tools, which are going to create other barriers, and so we point out that we really need to look hard at the exceptions process, the appeals process, the way that prior authorizations and step therapy are adjudicated so that we can protect patient access, and we know those are hard, hard um, needles to thread. Medicare, um, MedPAC recommendations are by definition broad and apply to the entire program. Are they ever... Are they ever developed specifically for individual areas? They can get fairly specific. I mean, we're free to, to go as narrow or as wide as we want. Um, we don't choose to get into, for example, individual codes or individual DRGs in a payment system. We don't have the bandwidth. Uh, we've got a great staff at MedPAC. Uh, again, I keep using the we. It's a force of habit. There's a great staff in MedPAC that can do all kinds of work, but it's a staff of about 25 or 30 people. It's nowhere big as CMS. They can't get involved in sort of getting down to the level of individual payment codes. Um, and the commission, 17 commissioner that meets about eight times a year, we can't take on and get feel like you know, we can master an issue down at real deep levels of, of, of narrowness and make recommendations. But we can get some ways down that path. And I think what we try to do, though mostly, is to look at broad principles to make recommendations. We sometimes get a bit into the weeds. So one of the things that, that we did include in our, in our Part B package recommendations was a concern that average sales price, um, there are some manufacturers that don't report uh, accurate information. And so we recommended, we'd seen some evidence that we recommended that there be some further looking at the ASP reporting. Uh, and add some penalties to a manufacturer that doesn't report accurately. And lastly, uh, an advocacy question. What can the CSRO and other advocacy groups do to help bring issues to MedPAC and influence policy? 
It's a great question, and, and I think there's sometimes, and I'm sure this doesn't apply because I know some of the folks who, who do work, work for you guys, um, you know, you guys do understand this, but for the, for the broader group here, you know, MedPAC tries to be very open to listening to outside stakeholders, whether it's physicians, hospitals, beneficiaries, drug companies, PBMs, you know, go down the list. Um, the best way to do that is always to meet with the staff. As commissioners, you know, we come in and jump in on this process eight times a year at our meetings. You know, we get consulted in between meetings and so forth. But, you know, we really take up what the staff puts in front of us. We have a process by which we say, like, you're not dealing with this issue enough. We want to see more on this issue. We, at our meetings, we can say we want to hear more about options on this or different kinds of options. So we have our chance as commissioners to influence that process. But the staff obviously has a huge role. So what's really important for groups like yours to meet regularly with staff, to bring your concerns, to bring data. And one of the things I certainly saw over time is that the groups who came in and just said, we hate what you're doing, it's a bad recommendation, and just sort of stop there, it's kind of like, okay, that's not helpful. I mean, yeah, we do want to hear that. If you think it's a bad recommendation, we want to know that. What's much more helpful is when you bring us information, when you bring the staff information to say, we think this, the, the direction you're going is problematic, and here's why, and here's the data to help indicate that. Um, helping understand. So if we're talking about um, biosimilars and some of the issues of how do we make biosimilars more viable, some of the conversations you've been having so far today, you know, we want to hear from practicing physicians what leads you to be open to prescribing a biosimilar and what doesn't. Where do the rules of the program get in the way of your making that decision or push too strongly in one direction or another? And we want to know in concrete ways. If, if it looks to us like these drugs are comparable and are easily substituted, if in your practice you think it isn't, we need to understand that. You know, I need to understand as a policy person whether I'm sitting on MedPAC or not, but, but I'm just one researcher. And they go out and ask those questions, but they need for, for groups to come in, in a, not in a combative kind of, kind of way, but in a supportive way to say, help us understand better how, how thing X works. Your concern, we talked at the beginning about the, the payment, and we're trying to think about better ways to, to support cognitive care. Helping us understand where different specialties are doing cognitive care and where they're not. Now, we can look at the data, how many E&M codes different specialties use, and that kind of stuff. That gives us a lot of the information. But understanding a level below that, uh, willingness to, to think about some of the procedures that people do and where there are efficiencies and where, you know, there's room when it's going to be a zero-sum game because that's what Congress forces on us, where that can be done in a way that won't be, cause too much pain. Well, before we finish, I'll just share one brief story of a MedPAC meeting. We've met with staff many times. One meeting, I don't remember the topic. Uh, we were talking to Joan and at the end of the meeting, she said, you know, we really like rheumatology. And we all sat up and said, <laughs> really? What is it about rheumatology that you like? Uh, she said, in all the changes, you're one of the only specialties that doesn't change your behavior based on the change in policy. Uh, and that was, that, was our, that was our last meeting there. Uh, one of our last meetings. So it's true, I think, uh, meeting the staff on a regular basis does help to transmit information and, and help our advocacy. So I want to thank you again for coming and sharing your views with us. And Mike, I guess you're going to... We have time for a question. Oh, good. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Madeline Feldman, uh, New Orleans. So. I think we share your concern that if the rebate system goes away, what is going to um, keep the manufacturers from continuing to raise their price? Well, when I speak about this, there's two kinds of competition. There's the competition that lowers prices, and then there's the competition that raises prices. And two examples are when you're going to buy a house, well, let's start off if you're going to build a house, you get bids 
usually you'll take the lowest one if everything else is equal. But if you're going to buy a house, <laughs> the more people bidding, the higher the price goes. And the system that we have now is the latter, is the one when you're going to buy a house. The higher the rebate, the higher the price, the better the chance you're going to get the spot on the formulary. What we need to create is the type of competition that works when you're building a house. Therefore, you have an open formulary, but to get on that formulary, everyone has to bid with their lowest price. And you set a floor for the lowest price. There's no payback for every time you fill a prescription. It's just a lowest price. Call me crazy, but to have a formulary based on efficacy, safety, and the lowest list price would be the way to go. So create competition where you have to decrease your price to get on the formulary, not increase. You know, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, when I first looked at PBMs a decade or more ago, I saw a lot of the process they were doing that looked a lot more like that. And some things have happened to sort of change that. And I, and I am concerned about sort of the concentration and, and the fact that, that when, a, when, a, when a state Medicaid program, when a large manufacturer, I mean, um, a large insurer or a large uh, corporation dealing with its self-insured business goes to the PBMs, there's not a lot to choose from. Now, there are still a couple, and so they ought to be asking more of those kinds of questions. Often they don't know to ask those questions. And you know, in a way, the, the Medicare Part B, you know, is, is, doesn't have the same intervention of a PBM. You can, you know, may have your own concerns about how the ASP system works, and one of the things we tried to do, uh, and not everybody likes this, but was to encourage to putting the originator drug and the biosimilars into one coding category so they can more directly compete on pricing. And then you'd have an incentive. You'll make more money if you go to the lower cost of the choices. Now, obviously, you know, clinical concerns have to enter into that, and that get, where it gets more complex. And so we, we talked a lot about whether you know, there are concerns in that and how broadly you could use that kind of thing. Maybe only use it where there's deemed interchangeable, maybe use it for all biosimilars. But again, the underlying goal was sort of what you're talking about, try to get some notion of now the manufacturers have incentive to lower prices because that will put them in a more favorable position against their competitors. Thank, thank you very much, Jack. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both.